Thank you. It's terrific to be back in London, the city of my birth, and I'm on the last line, not the first line. Um, so it's you know it's a really interesting time in terms of uh, healthcare, and particularly here at Wired Health, we're thinking about rewiring healthcare, and we're really in this exponential age. So I'm going to try and pull and connect some of the dots you've heard about today, and hopefully help ex exponentially move us into the future. Um, obviously, we heard a lot about a lot of different technologies here today. I was asked by Wired to uh, contribute to the world in 2017 which um, was published a month or two ago. And it gave me the perspective of, you know, even looking back 10 years ago, where were we in terms of technology and healthcare? If you think about it, the term quantified self was only coined 10 years ago by the executive editor of Wired, um, Kevin Kelly. And we uh, now see that, that that term has exploded. 10 years ago, Twitter launched at South by Southwest. Facebook finally got out of university settings. Um, 2009, the first Fitbit finally launched. So it's really been really relatively recently that many of these technologies are in our pockets. 13 years ago, I did a project with NASA where we developed a black box for the body, but that was huge and expensive and made for the space station. Now these technologies are ubiquitous on, on most of our wrists or in our drawers after we've lost the chargers. So um, as we move forward now, we're now in a point where we can measure almost any part of physiology behavior using very low cost, ubiquitous technologies. And of course, they're riding this wave of exponentials. You know, these smartphones, think about it, it was only 10 years ago, 2007, that the first iPhone launched. And I found my antique iPhone, it still works. At the time, it was magical. Now it feels slow and clunky and has a low resolution camera. And of course, we're now in the era of, of iPhone 7. And since I come from the Bay Area and have some friends at Apple, I have a quick look at what the iPhone 10 is going to look like and the iPhone 11. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't tweak that. But of course, these are becoming healthcare platforms, and they're riding the power of exponentials. You've heard about from robotics to beyond, the power of Moore's law, getting compute, computation faster and cheaper. Just one example of exponentials where things are getting cheap and more available, and where the opportunity to reimagine healthcare and disrupt it occurs. So think not just linearly. Our minds are wired linearly. 30 steps will be across the room. But start to think exponentially, because it's hard to think exponentially. 30 exponential steps brings us to a billion steps. 31st step is 2 billion steps. That's um, many times around the planet. And we see that all around us. The trick is how do we leverage that and connect those dots in smart ways in health and medicine and get out of the silos of how we define medical practice uh, um, for eons. So we're still in an era of siloed healthcare. Many ways we practice medicine haven't changed. We're still based on intermittent and episodic data that's still often very fragmented. We're still using fax machines in many of our top academic centers to communicate. And so for, we're quite reactive. We wait for the heart attack, the stroke, the lump to be discovered at stage three and stage four. And I'm an oncologist. We're tired of seeing late stage disease. So I think the hope of connecting many of the dots we've heard about today and have seen examples of are to become much more continuous and proactive in healthcare and even patient-centered. Today, we're not really that patient-centered. We're spending twice as much time typing medical records, at least in the US, and FaceTime with our patients. So as we move to en enhance healthcare and get truly patient-centered, let's move beyond the triple aim, you know, better outcomes at lower cost, and think also about that quadruple aim, improving the experience for the often burnt out physician, uh, nurse, uh, um, pharmacist, and beyond. So, Let's move again as we reframe this new era of wired health from sick care to health care. And let's look at some of those dots that we can connect. Because it's not often about just the data. It's how we make it true information we can use at the point of care. We're now overwhelmed, potentially, with exponential amounts of data. It's how we look at all that that's beneath the surface to bring that to truly not just evidence-based medicine, but I think intelligence-based medicine. So. Um, Connecting the dots is difficult. Many of the docs don't talk to each other. The incentives are often misaligned. We're incentivized to spend more money on treating the disease after it happens than before. But that, of course, is starting to shift as we move to more value-based care. Outcomes are going to be the new out incomes for many of the new devices, technologies, applications. And it's a matter of converging technologies across the exponentials if we're going to re really be connecting those dots. So it's no one technology, not just Moore's lots, from AI and robotics and 3D printing coming together. I get a chance to play a role in that, sharing the medicine side of Singularity University, and founded a program six years ago called Exponential Medicine, the theme of which, like today, is to bring smart folks together from different fields to look at where technology is, how do we leverage it into the future? And many of the great speakers here have cross-fertilized with us out in California. Um, and something magical happens when you bring folks from often outside of medicine together. Put them in scrubs, show them the latest, show them the problem areas, have them meet patients, have them um, uh, demo elements, try drones, not just taking pictures, but to deliver drugs and vaccines and beyond. That's where a lot of the magic happens. So again, think exponentially as you go forward. Because now with exponentials, we have computers the size of a grain of rice. They're becoming connected. You know about the Internet of Things. We're coming to the Internet of Medical Things. And we're now in the 4G world, but in two or three years, we'll have 5G. 
100 times faster than our current uh, speeds on our smartphones and mobile technologies. Um, that enables us to take the medicine from the hospital to the home, to the phone, to into and onside our own bodies. So tremendous opportunities to reshape, you know, waiting in the waiting room for an hour for that 12-minute visit, often sort of incremental medicine, whether you're here in London or, or uh, Bombay, incremental medicine, and move it forward. Here in England, there's some great progress. NHS is starting to pay for some of these connected devices and prescribe them to patients. The sensors are evolving from just accelerometers to sensors on our pills that can track adherence. We're going to blood pressure cuffs that can live on our watches. A whole slew of technologies, some of you saw here today, from glucometers that talk to, talk to your Apple Watch, to glucometers that can actually live on your watch, to uh, patches now, sort of plastics as you call them here, that can stream basically an EKG in terms of data anywhere in the world, you have that information. Sometimes too much data, how do you as a clinician make sense of it and how are we liable for it as we move forward? So from wearables on our feet, to shockables that can get you going. Hearables in our ears will not just give us information, there'll be AI embedded in our, in our ears. Um, ringables, like the aura ring that I'm wearing, can track sleep, something so critical, and I'm the behind on my jet lag today. We're in the era of uh, other fun other things like breathables. Breath, the biomarker of breath, can be used in very interesting ways, not just if you're going out on a date to check the quality of your breath, but to pick up things like lung cancer or metabolic diseases early. Sweatables. May, may be interesting if you're running a triathlon, but may be useful for patients with heart failure, renal failure. Socks that can track patients with diabetes and the care of their feet. Lots of things are moving. We heard from a Parkinson patient. How can you quantify someone's um, uh, tremor and optimize medication? So a lot of this is just up to our imagination as technologies are enabling these to become exponentially more available and inexpensive, all the way to putting them in your glasses, which may or may, may not be useful, um, but um, gives us a, a, a lens to use this information, hopefully, in smart and new ways. We've heard about the brain today. We now have low-cost brain-computer interfaces that can improve your mindfulness or meditation or now be combined with your, your reading glasses and potentially optimize mental health or treat uh, um, cognitive disorders. We're now at a point where our voice can be a biomarker. Voice can track mental health. It can be used to track your friends and family. If they're happy with you or not, you can do that on an app. All the way now to listening to the voice and detecting, as this company Beyond Verbal did at Mayo Clinic, to, to measure um, heart failure. So we're going to have new ways of using biomarkers from many realms. So don't think about quantify itself as just the things on your, on your wrist as we go forward. Your gut, uh, a major element now. We have EKGs for your gut and things that can measure number two, which might be uh, uh, good or bad. So um, lots of examples. I probably have too many here. Um, but you know, important elements. The health of our pregnant women and the health of the fetus can be measured. And then when the baby's born, we can censor other things uh, and uh, give us proactive information. So as this information comes uh, more easily, the challenge is, what do we do with it? Just because my son can be censored, and I can tell he's waking up every two hours, maybe isn't that useful for me. But if I'm a pediatrician sending someone home from the NICU or the PICU, I might want to be able to use that information, their temperature, how much milk intake they have. What's really, I think, shifting as we connect the dots is these technologies are coming to our pockets. Inspired by Star Trek, I helped um, form the Tricorder X Prize, launched about four years ago. About 400 teams entered this competition, uh, many of them converging from many fields to create real-life tricorders. Uh, here's an example of a company that started at Singularity University. You hold it to your forehead, it pulls down your temperature, your heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, integrates with AI on your smartphone. They've also developed ways to do smart urinalysis, so you can use your smartphone as a lens to pick up your UA and send that data to your doctor, to the CDC, to the NSA, whoever else is listening to your urinalysis. Um, we have ways now, of course, to, um, and, and by the way, this, the finals of these uh, teams will be announced uh, next month by the XPRIZE. And these are, these are coming to market. We will soon see maybe prescribed by the NHS and others, these integrated devices that can give you what required a clinic or emergency room or an ICU uh, and to connect those dots in this era of often connected mobile and digital health. I think we'll just call it health soon. We're not gonna call it you know, connected or digital health. That's a bit of a buzzword. It's how we're putting these pieces together as we go forward. So the challenge is, as we go from wearables to insidables, contact lenses from Verily uh, to things underneath our skin that can chip our information, how do we use that to be proactive, to manage uh, prevention, diagnostics, and therapy? Because these technologies are here today. How do we pay for them? How do we regulate them? The FDA, the EMA, they're not always thinking exponentially. We can use these to nudge us. We heard about nudges to train us. The idea of our posture and our smartphone here isn't good today. There's an Israeli company that's on the market with a device that buzzes your back, and after a, a, about a week of wearing it for an hour a day, improves your posture and lower back pain. We still need to show that these things work where I'm based out of Stanford and UCS, so we now have um, digital health centers looking at these in, in smart trials, showing that they work. Disruptive business models we've heard about today, you know, 
the Ubers of everything. Uber for health is sort of here. Press a button on the app, a nurse will come and give you your flu shot. Um, and other models are disruptive that change the game of bringing a physician or nurse to you using these sort of applications. So this changes many industries. We've seen Kodak disappear. Other companies disappear through disruption. No one wants to be the next Kodak. You want to Uber yourself before you're Kodak. That's the mindset we also need in healthcare. And old companies are doing that. Philips is now moving to making FDA-approved wearables. Nokia got disrupted in the phone business. They're in the digital health space. Now, what does this, all this mean? It's overwhelming. We're going to be often online continuously with our digital exhaust. That's terabytes of data. And again, it's a a bit of maybe going too far unless you can use that in smart, impactful ways. It's a bit of a, a so what. You can have a genome now for $100 in a couple of years. What happens if you bring that to your clinician? They don't know what to do with this. So in connecting the dots, we need to start designing smart systems, whether it's your genome, your microbiome, which is increasingly, as we heard, important in healthcare, um, bringing us maybe to a, a excremental medicine, but there's another sideline. Um, but really important information we're learning to crowdsource and make sense of. It's a so what, however, if you have to keep charging your device, devices, if that information can't flow to your clinician, if we can't extract the useful information there. And so we need to focus about bringing this connected era of accessible, digestible, and actionable information, and also, again, aligning the incentives for the consumer, the patient, to see data where they live, to integrate that, you know, to make incentives maybe monetary or otherwise. Um, there, we're now seeing insurance companies pay folks to wear devices and track information and lower their premiums or give them monetary rewards. So we're starting to align these incentives and hopefully personalize them for the individual. And of course, people are going to hack these systems as well as we go forward. Um, now, um, we need to pr pr make nudges and beyond precise. No one has a sort of one size fits all. As we're individuals and we can own our data, we need to share it in inf interesting ways and acquire it where we live. The Amazon Echo, the Google Home, they're all going to become part of our healthcare system. We can ask them about our blood sugar or to order meds or help us call emergency if we've fallen down. We've heard about chatbots today, which are getting smarter and more integrated with artificial intelligence. And as these come together, we'll connect the dots to the consumer. We'll apply uh, mental health care through ch ch chatbots to folks who don't have access. We'll hopefully bring this into the workflow of the poor clinician who's overwhelmed with new devices and, and, uh, and click boxes. And that's starting to happen. We're really moving from quantified self, the year of owning your data on your devices, to quantified health. And where this is starting, to, just in the last year, connecting is things like HealthKit, at least where I'm based at Stanford. I can now see my phone data, but now I can opt in to press a button and connect that to my clinician. So my clinician now, on my, through my smartphone, can see my data. And he's writing me a note, I, I can see your steps, heart rate, and weight data. I'm like, uh-oh, he can see that data. That might change my behavior. And he doesn't want to log in to see 2,000 patients' data. It needs to be smartly presented to him in proactive ways. And that, of course, requires design thinking in our electronic medical records, in our clinics of the future. Uh, Forward just launched, inspired by Apple, to make the clinic of the future and present information in understandable ways to meet the patient with where their age and culture and language might be. We're starting to see the FICO scores of health, so we can integrate not just our digital data, but our social network information, our sexual health, see predictalytics. Where are we heading with these trends? Because data by itself, again, is a bit of a so what. So where does this come together? Kind of the on-star for the body, I think. You know, our modern cars have hundreds of sensors. We're going to hopefully see the integration of our own check, check engine lights for the body. The sensors will become ubiquitous. It's going to be the software layers that makes meaning as we connect those dots. And in examples at Stanford, uh, Dr. Snyder was wearing many of these devices and figured out early from the integrations information that he indeed had Lyme disease before he even knew it. We can take inspiration also from the Teslas of the world that update themselves in the cloud and have a hive mind. They get better as they drive by sharing information from other Teslas. So I think as we pull this integrated exponential age together, we'll be crowdsourcing thousands of genomes and learning, as we've seen here, that there are three at least distinct subtypes of type 2 diabetics and use that in actionable ways to uh, drive coaching um, and uh, healthcare across the spectrum. So I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm going to jump to the chase at the end. Um, all these stills were here. I, I, I went kind of far. I was, I was optimistic, you know. <laughs> um, to kind of go back to the car analogy, the map. You know, we now have layers of new data that we've never had accessible before, and we can layer them up in smart ways. And just like 10 years ago, we were using paper maps. We couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze today. This is a, a, a Waze map of Rome built in a day just from the driver data. I think we can have that same sort of integration of healthcare information, and we'll opt in to share our speed and location or our health information and get information about the traffic and drive the healthcare equation to improve around the world. So let's not think about being organ donors and blood donors. Let's start to be data donors, connecting the dots from the NHS to Kaiser to Medicare to Medicaid to ourselves. And look at the convergence of technologies as we connect the dots, many of which we saw here today. 
And one of, the, uh, one of my inspirations, Tony Young, who's been exponential medicine, has now taken that sort of exponential mindset and that convergence to bring it to young clinicians. A new clinician entrepreneur program here has formed, uh, spurred many new innovations and platforms. So uh, the new doctors, the new innovators are all around us. So think exponentially, realize that the puck is here in 2017. Like Wayne Gretzky, skate to where it's gonna be in 2020 and 2027. And if we do that, Remember, a lot's gonna happen. More's gonna happen in a decade than the last 100 years. We can move from our episodic and reactive sick care world, the one that's much more continuous, proactive, and participatory. So let's all connect the dots, take exponential steps, and not predict the future, but go out and boldly create it together. So thanks for your time and attention.